Philippians chapter 2, one of, my, one of my, my favorite, favorite, favorite passages of Scripture. The, the passage itself just speaks so much. It, it really does speak to uh, the, the heart of Christ. It speaks to the heart of Christmas. Philippians 2 just encapsulates the Christmas story from a very unique perspective. We are wrapping up our Church Family Value Series today. This is the last value that we're going to talk about. And I hope and I pray that over the course of the last several weeks that these values have kind of taken a, a, a place in your heart. That these are values that are important to us. We feel that these are values that reflect the heart of God. That these are values that reflect Christ and I just want to kind of remind us that, you know, as we walk with Jesus, as we are a church, as we are the people of God, the body of Christ, that we would truly reflect his heart and that we would be in this world and in this community a picture of the heart of Jesus. I hope that that happens amongst us all. We value people being themselves, coming and and not feeling like that they've got to put on airs or they've got to dress a certain way or talk a certain way. We just really value people feeling like they can come and be themselves. So uh, the first value that we looked at was the value of just being yourself, being authentic, being real, being sincere. Then moving from there, people need to belong. They need to, to feel like that they are accepted and that the people around them love them and, and that people really genuinely want to do life with them. We're discovering that a lot of people, when they come to a church family or a church body, they're kind of wondering, can I belong there long before they ever accept certain beliefs? In fact, what we're seeing today is that people are not placing in the, in the top of their priority list certain particular doctrinal affirmations. You know, beyond Jesus and His sacrificial death and His atonement for us and beyond the indwelling of the Spirit in our lives, beyond that, people are not placing a high priority on certain doctrinal details. But they're looking to belong. Can my family fit here? Can I fit here? Can I belong? Long before they come to that place of belief. And we, see, we saw this in Scripture with guys like Thomas, with guys like Philip, you know, they were in process. They were on a journey. And, and today, you're, you're on a journey too. You're on a journey yourself of believing. Thomas, Philip, they were struggling at points of their faith. Philip had been with Jesus, didn't know he was the Father. Jesus said, I, have, have I been with you so long? And yet you don't know. And, and how many times do you think he could say the same to us. You've been with me. I have been with you so long, yet you still, you still don't know. You're in process of coming to believe. But it's important that you believe. It's important that you have that point of surrender in your life. And when we, what we saw with Thomas was Thomas, his doubt became belief. His belief became trust. And his trust led him to basically surrender his, his life to the Lord. So people are in process. And there comes that point of belief. It's really important. Then after that, and what we saw in the life of Jesus is that rarely did there, anybody ever come to Jesus a certain way and stay the same. Coming to him, or personal change rather, was never a requirement to come to him. Jesus doesn't say, listen, clean up your act and then come to me. Become somebody different. Then come to me. No, come to me as you are. And then, once we spend some time together and, and you believe and, and I do my work in your life, then you're going to be changed. So personal change and transformation is a result of coming to Jesus. It's not a requirement to come to him. But being transformed is important. It's important for all of us. That, that God is working in our hearts, He's working in our lives, He's changing our flesh patterns. 
He's changing us inside out. We're not being conformed to the world outside in. So we have to be strong in our commitment to Christ and our walk with Him. He changes us inside out. Let's not be conformed to the world, but let's be transformed by the renewing of our, our mind. And then we come to something that's really neat and special. We go from being ourselves to belonging to belief to being transformed to this. And this is what happens when Christ really starts working in and through our lives. We get to be a blessing to other people. We get to be a blessing to the world. Christ through us begins to bless others. Now, I do want to be careful at this point when we think about the five B's. Because it's not like, well, step one, check. Step two, check. Step three, step four, step five. Actually, what happens is these five values, these five B's, they're actually intermingled together. They're like circles, like the Olympic circle, if you can imagine the Olympic circles and how they're connected together. So you, you never get to a point where you stop being yourself and you never get to a point where you stop belonging and you never get to a point where you stop believing. I've, I've graduated from that. No, you're still in process of belief and believing. You never get to a point where you've transformed all that you're going to be transformed and then your spiritual growth stops and then you say, well, check that. Now I can be a blessing. No, these are almost intermingled together like the Olympic circles and how they're connected together. You're constantly moving in and out of all of these. But being a blessing is very, very significant in this journey and in this process. And, and let's just be honest today. Jesus, he's a blessing to us. All that he did, all that he said, all that he accomplished on the cross, being raised from the dead, Jesus is a blessing to us. And now he wants to be a blessing through us. So let's think about that today, okay? Jesus is a blessing to us. Now, he wants to be a blessing through us to others. And let's think about this too. One of the first ways that Jesus was a blessing to us was him being a blessing through somebody else into our lives. Is that not right? Someone came alongside you, they loved you, they supported you, they encouraged you, they took time for you, they visited you while you were sick, they came to you in a moment of affliction of your life, they sent you a card, they sent you a text message and said, I'm thinking about you today, I'm praying for you. Rarely does Jesus not work first through somebody else's life and coming to us and being a blessing to us. We need to be very, very thankful that Jesus works through other people. He's worked through other people in my life time and time and time again. And now he wants to work through my life to be a blessing to other people. I get to be a part of that in him. Philippians chapter 2, coming to this fifth B, or being rather, we look at these as values, values that are important, values that shape us, church, family values, things we rally around, things that we embrace. We need to talk about them from time to time to be reminded of them as to why they're so important. But look at this with me in Philippians chapter 2, and let's talk about today about how. How, how can I, can I be a blessing to others, and, and what does that look like? Paul writes to the church of Philippi. He says, If therefore there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion. Now, if we could look at this, and I want to go back to the first part of this verse, and I will look today just at the key words for this verse. And I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you today need these in your life? Who needs encouragement? Who needs love? Next part. Who needs fellowship? 
of the Spirit. Who needs affection? Anyone here today need affection? What about compassion? This is a really interesting word. When you break down the word compassion, it means to come with passion. Compassion is coming alongside with passion. It's engaging. It's, it's interacting. Compassion is having an object and showing love and passion to that object. It's coming with passion. That's what compassion is. It's coming with passion. How many of you today need some folks to come at you with some passion? Or affection? Or love? Or encouragement? This is how Paul starts this really neat passage of Scripture. He starts talking about the things that really we all need, apart from our basic needs being met as people. In fact, I would dare say that some of us today, if we could have a really, really large bank account, but yet have no love and have no compassion and have no affection or fellowship in the Spirit with other people, I would dare say we would all just cash all the money in the world in and we would take these things, right? Because these are so important to us in our lives. I'd rather be poor and have these in my life than be rich and not have any of these in my life. Because after all, without these working and operating in our lives, what's life anyway? Right? So Paul just starts this great passage of Scripture out, and he's hitting the nail right on the head. And he's saying again, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any infection of compassion, and people would say, Paul, you don't even have to say if because there is. Listen to this. There is. There is encouragement in Christ. There is consolation of love. There is fellowship of the Spirit. There is affection there is compassion. Then here's the question. How do I know that? How do I know that? And then he brings them around to themselves. To who they are as a people, the body of Christ. How does the world know that there is any encouragement in Christ? How does the world know that there is any compassion in Christ? It is through the body of Christ. It is through us that the world knows. It's through us that you know, I hope. It's through you that I know that. For what you've meant to me in my life, have you been there? Hopefully have we been there for you? Have you have been there for one another? He says in verse 2, Make my joy complete. And here's the kicker. By being of the, and you say this with me today, by being of the what? The same mind. The word mind in Scripture is the same word for heart. It means to be of the same heart. To be of the same mind means to have common convictions. It means to have common understandings. It means to have common values. And who or what is our greatest common value and denominator today. It is Christ and His Spirit. Paul is speaking to the power of unity in the body of Christ. And there are so many things that come against unity, and there are so many things that come against us being able to reflect and show love, compassion, affection, etc. Sometimes we get selfish. We get selfish. Sometimes we want to defend ourselves and our flesh. Sometimes we get really full of pride and ego. And what does the Scripture say about what happens after pride, right? What happens after pride? What comes always after pride? There always comes a what? A fall after pride, right? Selfish desires, ambitions, pride, ego, having my way. Wanting things done my way. A, a, a focus on myself and what gratifies me and what fulfills me. These are things that keep us from being unified and these are things that keep us 
from reflecting the compassion and the love and the grace and the affection of Jesus. So Paul tells them to listen. Be of the same mind. Maintaining the what? Not just the same mind, but maintaining the same love. The love of who? It is the love of Christ working through us. United, he says, united in spirit and intent on what? On one purpose. It's really the formula for a team being effective. When the team has a common goal and everybody's working together for that common purpose, great things can be as a, as a team. We, we played some teams this past weekend that had a bunch of individual players who were probably better than any individual player we had on our team. But our team is comprised of some kids who've played together since the second grade. It's almost like second nature for them to know their positions, to know their roles, to know where somebody else is going to be. Long ago, they came together with a common purpose to win basketball games. And today, they work together for the most part as a functional unit. And we beat many teams that have better athletes and individuals on that team, but what's happened over time is because the team has a, a common or one purpose and it's become united, it's a better team. You've seen this played out at work with people you work with. When you're at work and everybody's working and pulling together for a common purpose, great things are done at work and your business. It happens in family lives. When the family is pulling together and working together with a common purpose, families are stronger, right? We see this played out all throughout life, and we also see this being played out in the body of Christ. So whenever this part is going that way, and that part's going that way, and we're not moving toward the same purpose, we're weakened. But even worse than that, what is weakened is the demonstration of the affection, the compassion, the encouragement, and the love of Christ that he wants to de demonstrate through our lives. So Paul encourages them to come together with a common purpose, to be of the same mind, the same love, united in the spirit and intent on one purpose. Verse 3, think of how many, listen to this, how many problems would be solved in our lives today if we had this heart and this mind about what he's going to talk about next. Do nothing. We should highlight the word nothing. It's okay. Do nothing. Nothing is no thing, right? Y'all say that we do what? Do nothing. Nothing. No thing. From selfishness or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, esteem or regard one another as what? More important than ourselves. Now some of you might be asking today, so if I continually just give of myself and I continue to have this humility of mind and I'm always looking out for other people, then who's going to look out for me? You ever thought about that? I've even heard people say, well, you know what? If, if you don't look out for yourself, nobody else is going to look out for you. That might be how the world functions and how the world operates. Paul is speaking in the context of the body of Christ. And he's talking about just an organization. He's not talking about a gathering on a Sunday morning. He's talking about people who come together in the Spirit to do life together. And that they are as mindful, listen to this, they are as mindful of one another on Monday as they are on Sunday. And they're as mindful of one another on Thursday as they are on Sunday, or Thursday as Monday, or Wednesday as Friday, or Saturday as Sunday. He's speaking of a people who come together and do life together, and it's not confined to a building or just an organization, but it's really people doing life together. Paul's picture and understanding of how the body of Christ works is that people will be there 
to love each other and support each other and to have each other's back. So here's the deal. So if I am setting my heart and my mind to show the love of, of Christ and the compassion of Christ in your life, and I am a part of this body, then I can trust the Holy Spirit of God to have my back through somebody else's life. And that's how we get our needs met. Our legitimate needs met. But this has never, listen to me, this has never, never happened in my life when my focus was on me. And let me tell you what happens. And you tell me if this has not happened to you. Whenever your focus gets on you, you begin to isolate yourself. You're not thinking about other people. You're thinking about yourself. You begin to isolate then once you isolate and you kind of drop back and step back and you, maybe you go and you have your pity party and I've had my pity parties, I've had plenty of them. What is out of sight is often what? Out of mind. So what has happened is the enemy has isolated me in my own self-perception. And he's isolated me in this pity party over here. So I'm not thinking about anybody else. I'm thinking about me. But what I've done is I've isolated myself from the very people God wants to work through in their life to encourage me. And I have cut myself off. And you know what happens over here too sometimes? I mean, if I could just hide, I'd hide. Okay, I'm hiding. Nobody cares about me. Nobody loves me. Nobody's reaching out to me. Well, nobody from that congregation has contacted me in two weeks. They don't even know I'm missing. Woe is me. And then we start finger pointing. Boom! Well, they got a problem over there. And then we'll pull a few people in behind, hide with us. Oh, they got a problem over there. Oh, they're, they're, they got the problem. They got the problem. We start finger pointing. And we start throwing rocks. You know what's happened? We've moved outside the house. Rock throwing never takes place within the house. Rock throwing always takes place outside the house. But we have isolated ourselves. And by having that self-driven focus, we have cut ourselves off from the meaningful love, compassion, and affection we need from other people. So here's what's always happened in my life. It's never happened in my life when I was focused on me. It's always happened in my life when I focused on other people. When I became concerned about what you were going through in your life when I was there, or whenever I was thinking about you or praying for you, when I was kind of focusing on other people, and you know it's the same for you too. When you're concerned about other folks, it has a way of coming back around to you, and you just not being engaged and involved to meet their needs. But they're also engaged and involved in your life for the Lord to meet your needs through them. How many times have you ever called somebody up and said, hey, how you doing? And they said, hey, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Hey, by the way, how are you doing? Oh, gee. Well, let me tell you. Who initiated that call? You initiated the call. But who ends up getting their needs met? You do because your focus was on somebody else. Happens every time that way. He says in verse 3, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself, not merely looking out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Verse 5, Have this mind. Have this attitude. How many times have you heard of late, perhaps, or have you ever heard in your life that attitude determines what? Attitude determines altitude. What your attitude is and what your perspective is at any given point in time, how you're seeing things and, and how you feel about things, really affect how you are living out your life. You know, something I want to challenge you with today is just a few simple things. These are things that I struggle with. Because I, my mind can take me to bad places pretty quick sometimes. Prayer I was just praying this morning. Lord, help me to always think the best of people. So many times I misunderstand where people are coming from. 
Lord, help me to always think the best of people. Lord, help me to see the good and not the bad. Help me to be thankful for the blessings that are in my life as opposed to focusing on any deficiencies or absences that are not in my life. Lord, help me to see beyond the actions of people and to look to a better motive, intent, and understanding. And I really believe that if those things start happening in our lives, we will soon become a great blessing in the lives of other people. Paul says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, to be hung on to. This is speaking of the pre-incarnate Christ. Before he showed up in Bethlehem, okay? Jesus existed before the manger. He existed before the donkey ride to Bethlehem. He existed Long before the Holy Spirit came to Mary. And long before the angel ever told her anything. He was there at the beginning of creation. All things were made by Him and through Him. And nothing was made that wasn't made through Him and by Him. He didn't hang on to that divine position. Why? Why? Because in order, listen to me, in order to show love, he had to come down to us. It's like the king, the king who said, you know, I'm pretty lonely up here in this castle. I've got all this power, I have all these riches, but I don't have a wife to share my life with. So one day he goes out among the people. As he's out among the people, he starts looking around, and he sees this beautiful young woman coming through town. And man, she captured his heart. She is the most beautiful thing. He overheard a conversation she was having, and he loved her heart. He loved everything about her. And then he realized that she was a peasant girl. And he thought to himself, he said, how in the world will she ever fall in love with me for me and not for my riches or my power? So he decided he would leave his castle. He'd leave all of his riches. He'd leave his power behind He would come and for months live as a peasant. He wore peasant clothes. He got a job. He worked among the peasants. He talked among the peasants. He got to know her. She got to know him. And over the course of time, the one who had captured his heart, he captured her. Why? Because he came down to her. And Christ came down to us. He relinquished his divine prerogative to do life just as he purposed or determined and lived a submitted, yielded life to the Father. Not my will, but what? Not my will, but what? Not my will, but your will be done. Not just in the Garden of Gethsemane, but time and time and time again. It was his prayer and his cry throughout his life. He never relinquished his deity. He just relinquished the divine prerogative to do things as he chose. He yielded himself to the Father. And then this is what happened next. So after he relinquishes that divine prerogative, he comes to us in verse 7. It speaks of Christ emptying himself. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of what? Being made in the likeness of men. Notice these two words real quick. Taking the form of a bond servant and servant and being made in the likeness of men. He became one of us. And while he was one of us, this is what he did. Verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. And not only did he humble himself, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
So Jesus is a blessing to us. And this is how you can be a blessing to others. If I have the very same heart and attitude. You know, he's given you some things today that you can use in your life today to be a blessing to other people. He's given you spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit has, in, has invested in your life. He has seen you worthy enough to give you certain gifts. And he wants to operate and work through those gifts. There's actually a spiritual gift assessment that's now available on our website. And we would love for everybody in our church to take this little assessment to help guide you and steer you toward where your strong and your weaknesses are in the spirit. You can go to our website. There's a link for it on our website. We would love for everybody here to have some sense of where their gifting is in the body of Christ. He's giving you resources. Resources where you can financially be a blessing to somebody else. Today we talked about taking a family to the Benton Family Resource Center. We talked about giving to the body of Christ. The monetary blessings of your life can be used in turn to be a blessing to others. We can't do what we do without people faithfully giving. Kids don't get clothes. We don't take care of the things we need to take care of here. We, we don't do the ministry things without people faithfully giving. And time. Listen to this. I'm, I'm going to share this with you. This is the last thought, okay? One of the greatest things you've got today is time. You have time to give a listening ear. You have time to show a caring heart. And you have time to be a helping hand. You may not have a lot of money. You may not think you've got great gifts. But if you've got air in your lungs today, you've got some time. If you will stop being so focused on what you don't have and give a heart for what you do have and become focused on Christ and others, you'll be a great blessing. You are extremely important today. Your life has tremendous value. Your defeats do not define you. So stop letting your defeats defeat you. Your value is in not what you do, but is in what Christ has done for you. The value that you will have in somebody else's life is not the value that is inherent in you, but it is the value of Christ expressing and speaking His life through you. You're important. So let yourself be a blessing. Today I want to invite you to stand. and Maybe you just need some time.